I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Associate Pro Professor Felice Jacker. Um, I think it'll be a great segue into further discussion and, and talking about diet um, quality as a risk factor for depression and anxiety in children, adolescents, and adults. Felice Jacker's ongoing program of research focuses on lifestyle as a risk factor for the common mental disorders, depression, and anxiety. It comprises a broad range of epidemiological and population health investigations with extensive partnerships and collaborations in Australia and elsewhere involving acknowledged experts from the field of psychiatry and population health. The program spans the spectrum of research comprising detailed investigations of biological mechanisms and drivers of the relationships between lifestyle and mental health through to the development and evaluation of community-based interventions. Associate Professor Jacker's primary goal is to develop a coherent public health message and effective best practice strategies for the universal primary prevention of the common mental disorders, something I think we will really value. Thank you very much. Come through. Thanks, Emil. No problem. Um, I'm an ep epidemiologist, so I step back and I'm looking far more at sort of population risk factors and um, I'm more interested, I guess, in the public health implications of the new research in this area. But what Sunil said is really very important because at its root, what it's saying is that this Cartesian mind-body dichotomy that has really informed, I think, psychiatry through its history is, is a false one. And it's something that um, the sooner we break down the silos between psychiatry and the rest of medicine, the better off we'll be because when you look at psychiatric disorders, clearly when you think about the complexity of the, the systems involved, there really is no distinction. You have the, the gut and the brain are closely connected, the immune system and the CNS are closely connected. We really need to be looking far more holistically. As far as inflammation, the role of the immune system, oxidative stress goes, Stepping back even further and being more holistic, we know that the strongest uh, predictors of systemic inflammation and the associated oxidative stress, apart from severe medical illnesses, are lifestyle behaviours. So dietary habits, if we eat a healthy diet, we have lower levels of systemic inflammation, lower levels of oxidative stress. Conversely, if we have unhealthy diets, much higher levels of systemic inflammation, oxidative stress. Physical activity is anti-inflammatory. It also increases our own antioxidant capacity. Smoking is very pro-inflammatory, pro-oxidative stress. All of these lifestyle behaviours fundamentally underpin all of those complex systems that we're talking about and we ignore them at our peril. So I, as I said, I'm not a psychiatrist. I don't deal with patients. But what the new research that I'm going to present to you today, as well as having public health implications, it has very clear clinical implications. Uh, the other thing I would just briefly say too is, and it's a bit of a plug, um, I'm on the organising committee for this year's ASPR conference, so that's the Australasian Society for Psychiatric Research, which is in the first week of December in Melbourne this year. And it's going to be a terrific program, but Charles Raison, who's one of the world's leading experts on inflammation and, and psychiatry, is an invited plenary speaker at that conference. And there are also workshops, uh, clinical trials, mindfulness, genetics. There's a whole range of really interesting activities around that conference. So I would urge you to have a look at that. Um, and just finally, again, going back to that medical illness, mental health uh, nexus, all of the research in primary care, which of course is where most of the patients and people with depression manifest first, shows that the strongest predictor of major depression is poor physical health. So all of these systems are intimately linked and addressing physical health will have benefits. And of course the WHO has known for years that uh, good mental health is critical to good physical health. And so what we're saying now is the converse is also true. Physical health is really important for good mental health. So the data I'm going to give you a very brief flying overview of today and putting it into a context I think adds to this picture and it adds to what we already know about the importance of physical activity, being physically active, both as a prevention and a treatment strategy in depression. 
What I would also say is, although my talk today is really focused on the common mental disorders, depression and anxiety, it's highly relevant to dementia. And all of the research that's been done in Alzheimer's and dementia research is highly concordant with what we're saying, and they're really going along in parallel. So now we're starting to put those things together and talk about them uh, more holistically. So this is the context. The epidemiological transition is the transition from the primary killers of humans being the infectious diseases such as HIV and malaria to now being the NCDs, the non-communicable disorders that are primarily driven by changes to the food system over the last 30 or so years. We have a term now called globesity, and this is because the changes to the food system really manifested first in the West, but we're now seeing incredibly rapid increases in overweight and obesity as a marker of changes to the food system right across the globe. This is a, um, and many of you will know, uh, Indians do have a genetic predisposition to type 2 diabetes, but I do think that this really highlights these changes. A generation ago, type 2 diabetes was almost unheard of in India, whereas now a child born today will have a one in two chance of developing it. Now, there was a very good uh, documentary on telly just a couple of weeks ago on SBS, I think, that talked about the changes to the food systems there. And I remember when I first went to India in 1990, and there were no, none of these Western fast food places. They actually weren't allowed in the country. Once they opened their doors, so to speak, uh, now these um, junk food, food purveyors are on every corner and you can see the resulting impact on the population and the obesity rates. As before, we know that the way we eat habitually is a very strong predictor of uh, the NCDs, so cardiovascular disease, stroke, obesity, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, many forms of cancer, and now, as I said, uh, dementia. So when in nutritional epidemiology, we talk about dietary patterns. And I'll, I'll, it's worth actually spending a second on this because up until about the 2009, most of the research that had ever been done on nutrition and mental health or diet and mental health had really focused on individual nutrients. And this is primarily because uh, practitioners would think, oh, okay, well, if folate's important, then maybe I can give a, a folate supplement and that will do something useful. So most of the research really focused on folate and omega-3 fatty acids. But of course we know we don't just eat individual nutrients. We eat whole diets that are enormously complex in their composition and the way each of those components interact. So really looking at just single nutrients in many cases is of limited utility. We need to look at whole dietary patterns. There's different ways of doing that, um, but primarily what you'll see in the epidemiology from uh, all areas of medicine, as well as now in the emerging area of mental health, are these two types of dietary patterns. There's the healthy, and the unhealthy. Now, these are often called, uh, this is prudent or healthful, and this is called Western. But as we've just pointed out, it's not just in the West anymore. But what's important to recognise is two things. One is that this looks different in different jurisdictions. So of course, a healthy diet in Japan looks different to a healthy diet in Spain, which looks different to a healthy diet in Australia. But what they have at, at the core is a higher intake of nutrient-dense foods. So, so plant foods and lean red meats and fish and those sorts of things. This Western diet, on the other hand, is fairly ubiquitous. It looks pretty much the same everywhere because it's coming from the same source, which is the food industry. Now, the other important thing to understand about this when you look at these from a statistical point of view when you're doing research is that each are independently related to outcomes. So it's not that this is just the opposite of this. You can have lots of good healthful foods but also have a lot of unhealthy foods. Or the opposite, you may have fewer of the nutrient dense foods but you're also not eating a lot of McDonald's and things like that. And uh, they both seem to, we think, confer their own risk quite independently. And in fact, they're actually very, uh, the correlation between them in epidemiological studies is very, very low. So that's an important thing just before we start.